Welcome to Women in la Frontera. My name is Brenda nettles -Jerjas. On this podcast, I am joined by Christina Garza, a missionary, educator, activist, and Catholic nerd. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you for having me. Well, Christina, I'm really delighted that you're here with us today, because today we're going to embark on a conversation about a call to be a missionary and the defense of life. I'm delighted that you're here. You are um, teaching full-time, but tell us a little bit about how you became a missionary and how you came to the Rio Grande Valley. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here with you. Um, and I, I'm sure wondering how all of those things connect. Um, yeah, there might be a lot of questions. What is this California do girl doing in South Texas? Um, and I know that might be a little scary to have a Californian in South Texas, but I am a true plants, transplant and I'm here to stay. Um, so I am a teach an educator, a teacher, but um, actually that came later. So I started out mission work, I would say, in the pro-life work movement. And I think that it's kind of um, unusual and a lot of people have a que questions about how those two intersect. What do you mean mis missionary and pro-life? Because a lot of people have an idea in their, like we have this idea of missionary work as like somewhere outside of the United States or in a third world country or with a sari on with Mother Teresa, you know. Um, but Mother Teresa even said that we are, I mean, even the catechism says we're all called to mission, right? Um, but Mother Teresa would say, found, find the gutters. Everybody has their own gutters, right? Calcutta, you don't need to come to Calcutta to find the poor. And she said that the truly poorest of the poor, she would say, would be those who are spiritually poor. And she said that she found the spiritually poor in the United States. And so that was a lot. Um, just those kind of reflections really uh, were stuck with me in the beginning of, of my missionary work and my journey. Um, so I guess I'll I'll just start out in, in the beginning. Um, I was I was raised uh, I would say culturally Catholic, so the, a very common experience. Cradle Catholic. We didn't go to church consistently. Um, we weren't super devout. I wasn't catechized very well. Um, I received my first communion, and then we didn't really go back to church. And I made my confirmation as an adult, as a freshman in college, because one of my Catholic friends from high school had told me that I should probably get confirmed. I didn't even know what that process looked like. Um, in fact, she was probably the first person I met that I knew was being confirmed or that it was even like a big deal. So that's how poorly catechized I was. And because I had a really amazing youth group at my parish and because I had a really great confirmation sponsor, I was able to make the connection that because I was Catholic, I was supposed to be pro-life. Um, it was funny because it was never really discussed growing up. Um, my mom is a social, social worker, so we kind of grew up with the idea that pro-choice is, you know, the way to go. Um, just in case, just in case someone was raped or something, you had to be in pro-choice just in case, right? Um, so I knew enough by the time I was confirmed and was a freshman in college that I was pro-life, still not really understanding what that meant. And um, in college, I was convinced that my goal, the main thing that I needed to do was get through college and be successful and get a job. And um, like mission work was not really what I was aiming mm -hmm. for. I think that's the, the a, I won't say a, a common story, mm -hmm. but a, a common thread through many uh, young adults that mm -hmm. I meet today. And I think even in, in my case, the catechesis was just very different. Yes, yes. Um, and I think that you know, it's a little bit of a sorrow, but at the same time, we're seeing such a resurgence now in my generation of people who who see the value of catechizing um, the culture and our and children and and our own families. Yes, I mean, well, I, absolutely. I, I spoke with Lolis uh, earlier in a previous podcast, and she too shared some of those similar stories. and And it's it's fascinating to see how young adults are catechizing their families. Absolutely. I mean, I even even myself who works for the church, has been in the church, it's joyful to see my son and his wife I was just thinking of um, share what they learn because I'm continually learning something new Absolutely. through them as well. I had the great joy of meeting them and yeah, just to see like the beauty of their family and, you know, their goals are not just to make it and be success successful. Their goals are to be saints and to raise their son to be a saint. That's amazing. Yeah. 
So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, plugging away, going through college. And um, at first, I I would I want to say, like, I just had this big re- memory, this big moment um, of like kind of coming into the pro-life movement. But if, as I look back on it, there were really a lot of people that played a part in my conversion. And I think when I share with people about getting involved in pro-life work or any type of activism or evangelization, sometimes we can get discouraged and say like, oh, I didn't change their mind. Or, oh, I we get sometimes frantic, like, oh, I need to change this person's mind. But really, there were a lot of people and even organizations that played a part in my coming into the movement. So first, And just ahead. to show you that mm-hmm. passion about changing or my, your mind, people's minds is about saving babies. Exactly, I mean, babies. exactly. Hearts and minds, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. down, hopefully down the line lives, right? Um, yeah, so when I was in, I was a junior, actually, this is how hard my heart was. I was a junior in college. I went to a, a state school and there was a pro-life missionary team on my campus. And even though I was pro-life, I just could not believe how extreme they were to be trying to tell people about abortion. And so I uh, ignored them. I walked by them. I thought about them as the crazy abortion people. Um, And so the first time they were on my campus, I straight up ignored them uh, and went about my day and did not think about them anymore. And so the second time they were on my campus, thankfully, I think there was a little bit of guilt there because I felt like I should go up to them. But it was It was, you know, the Lord needs to purify us at all times because it was out of guilt. So I went up to them and I did one of these. I was, uh, I just wanted to make sure that nobody else saw me. And so I went up and very quietly told one of the missionaries, thank you for being here. I'm pro-life too. Good job. Bye. You know, I have to, like, I wanted to get to class and like not be seen with them. And uh, thank God for this missionary. She, she was like, "Uh, why don't you take a pamphlet? You know, with the kind of sideways glance, like, I've seen your kind before, right? And I was like, no, I don't need a pamphlet. I'm already for life. I'm Catholic. And I need to get to class. And she was like, well, why don't you take the pamphlet to class and read it later? And she was so persistent. And I I got impatient because she was persistent. And I was like, doesn't she hear me? I'm Catholic, right? But like, I I'm, also, already, I'm already, I'm already, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sold. I'm ready. I, yeah. I don't need the pamphlet. I don't need the pamphlet. <laughs> I already said I'm pro-life in public, in secret in public. <laughs> um, so I took the pamphlet and... Usually, I mean, on on that campus and usually at state schools, you just get handed so much stuff. I had a ritual of every night going and pulling out all the stuff I'd been given in the day and st- throwing it straight in the garbage can. So I was pulling out my stuff that night and this pamphlet, I just couldn't throw it in the trash. I felt so guilty. Um, and so I was like, well, OK, let me educate myself. I know I'm pro-life, but I guess more information won't hurt me. Right. And this is like the... I mean, the Lord is so good to me because I look back on this and I'm like, I was such a brat, right? And I opened this pamphlet and I read it word for word. And I could not believe that I hadn't been told. And this information was just so, it rocked my world. It was like the light switch turned on. Like I was in a dark room and all of a sudden the light had turned on. And I knew at that very moment that I needed to do something. And I ended up calling my confirmation sponsor that night like literally within the hour and saying, and I told her, take me to the abortion clinic the next time you go. I need to go. And there were, I remember distinctly, there were two things. It even makes me a little emotional thinking about it because it really was a life-changing moment to read the information. And there were two things that that caught me uh, that like really were like the tipping point for me. One was seeing the diagrams. It, the, in the pamphlet, it had a medical diagram of the abortion procedures. And seeing like the medical diagram and the medical terms, I just, I was like, I was surprised, shocked, and angered that nobody had told me what abortion was. That I had been confirmed, I had, I was a junior in college and nobody had told me what abortion was. Um, And I was just, I could not understand how I could be in my early 20s and not know what the abortion procedure was and that how could there be such a controversial conversation about this in our country and how could be people people be so vehemently pro-life or pro-choice and not say what the abortion procedure is how could how could i not know how could planned parenthood have been advertising in my high school newspaper and i not know what abortion was how did nobody tell me so i remember being extremely convicted about that and then i remember reading also the history of Planned Parenthood and how 
uh, minorities are targeted by the abortion industry. And here I was, a Latina woman trying to make it in the world and get my education. And I was at a college that was predominantly Hispanic. And I was being marketed by the Chicano Student Union. But at the same time, all of this was telling me that all of these the Chicano Student Union and, and my college and some of my professors were telling me that abortion was a woman's right, when really that wasn't the case at all. As a Hispanic woman, I was being targeted by an industry that wanted me dead. And so these two things for me were like, I just felt that if people knew, if people knew, if I could turn the light bulb on for other students like me, then of course they would be pro-life. Of course babies would be saved because all you, this information speaks for itself. Right. And there's still so much work to do. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about how you've been able to maybe change some people's uh, or educate people about the truths of abortion. Absolutely. Yeah. So the first thing I did was to go outside of an abortion center and get started as a sidewalk counselor. So I think that's the most familiar way that we see people um, getting involved in pro-life work is going to an abortion clinic to pray or to sidewalk counsel and to give women the resources they need to choose life. So that's one way, and I did that. Um, I did that first, and I've done that throughout the years. But then, um, as Providence would have it, I mean, this was years later. After I graduated, I wanted to get involved in pro-life work, and I mean, it was completely accidental, or providential, I should say. I ended up getting hired by the missionary organization that had sent the original missionaries to my college campus. Um, Something you never expected. <laughs> I never expected it. And I actually didn't realize that it was them who were on my campus till after I was hired. And so um, I ended up traveling the nation, going to colleges and high schools, educating about abortion and doing presentations and um, CCD classes and confirmation classes and Pro and retreats, confirmation retreats, getting involved in a lot of ways before women were at the sidewalk. And so that's one way that I think we don't see that everybody can play a part in that because whether it's having, handing a pamphlet to a classmate or talking to a friend or just knowing enough yourself to be able to share little bits of information with the people around you. Um, I mean, I did that in a big way because I was doing it full time. And so I was evangelizing full time. I was on college campuses and in um, public arenas. But um, did you yeah. I have to ask, did you have any young women come up and whisper to you in a uh, <laughs> public <but> secret <laughs> way that they were pro -li pro life, but didn't want the information? Like, did you meet another you? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, women and men. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I was in your position. Take the information. Yeah. I was much more passionate by the time they got to me. Um, and and there were a lot of women, too, who were on the campus um, who were pregnant and decided before they were in the arms, I, want, I say arms, but before they were in the office of the people trying to convince them to have an abortion, they were able to make the decision for themselves on, on campus. And I think that that was, it was an easier way to save babies. The decision to keep right. the baby. Correct. Because if a woman is contemplating abortion outside of an abortion clinic, there's still time to get her information. And there's still time where she's deciding in her own heart and mind. But once she's in the clinic, not to mention the spiritual, uh, the sp spiritual aspect of it, but the people who work in the clinic are trained to convince her to have an abortion. So it's that's what I infinitely don't understand. Harder for I her don't to understand leave. that yeah. you would think that these clinics would provide them with all their options and provide them with counseling. Right. And not just kind of lead them down the dark hallway of death. Right, right. But I mean, at the end of the day, abortion is a business. It's a big business. And so it would be in their best interest to convince their clients to continue with the abortion. So if we can get them before they're in the clinic, then the decision to choose life becomes easier. And so I saw a lot of women choose life. Um, on campuses before, you know, I mean, we were everywhere, sidewalks. Um, I just heard a story. This is so cool because this was years and years ago that we were at a campus in Bakersfield, California. And I just heard a story like a week and a half ago that the clinic finally made the connection. They had a week where there was an uptick, the 
pro-life pregnancy clinic, um, had an uptick in clients for one week and was trying to figure out what was it that got them to the clinic. And they recently figured out that maybe because someone had brought in a pamphlet or something, that it was because a team of missionaries was at their college handing out pro-life pamphlets. And then the publisher of the pamphlet, I guess they told the publisher of the pamphlet, the pamphlet, the publisher of the pamphlet was able to call um, and tell one of my former teammates, I think you you were at this campus at this time, and I just wanted to let you know that the pro-life pregnancy clinic had more clients choosing life that week. And we think it's because there were people at the college campus handing out this pro-life information. And what we didn't know was that it wasn't the students who were at the pro-life pregnancy clinic choosing life. It was their parents, their mothers. And so what I think that, um, I mean, that was a huge gift. The Lord didn't need to allow us to see that. But we don't realize when we share pro-life information, when we share the truth, evangelizing in any way, we just don't know where it's going to land. We don't know if it's that girl in front of us that needs the information or her sister or her mom or her cousin. We don't know if the guy in front of us who needs that information, if it's for his mom or his girlfriend or his wife or his sister. We just, we don't know. And like Mother Teresa would say, um, I'm just a pencil in the hand of God, right? And St. Jose Maria Escriba would say, I want to be the stamp on the envelope. And so I think that sometimes pro-life activism, pro-life outreach, um, pro-life evangelization, like that we have this idea of what it looks like in our head. And sometimes pro-life activists are painted as like these extreme, um, very zealous, very passionate people on a street corner. But we're all called to be that stamp or to be that pencil. We just don't know what God is doing with us in the moment. Um, And the truth is for everyone. Absolutely. I want to go back to something that you said about a little earlier about how you were afraid to speak out. Mm -hmm. You went and you whispered it. It was a public place, but you still whispered it. And I think many people find themselves in that place, particularly now as you see the, um, I almost say the, the violence is escalating to some degree or just that, that anger um, of those who um, are supporting abortion without um, maybe understanding all that that entails. I mean, about the, the fact that there is a baby. Absolutely. Who deserves yeah. a choice. Let's talk yeah. about the baby's choice. Right, right. Yeah, that innocent human being. Um. So, sorry to clarify, why was I scared to speak out? Or, or, or how can we encourage others to speak out? Okay. Like with you, it was a process. It was. It was a long process. Um, and at first, to be honest, it wasn't because I was afraid that I would be persecuted by pro-abortion people. Like I didn't even know people were gung-ho pro-abortion at that time. I was so, you know, out of out of the loop. I think I was just, I didn't, um, I wanted to go about my day. And I think that that's a lot of the reason I think that people are afraid to speak out, and this goes back to the the peril of the Good Samaritan, sometimes we just don't want to be bothered. We don't want the extra responsibility. We don't want to look at the person bleeding and dying on the side of the road. We don't want to. Once you ask the question, once you ask, what is abortion? Once you ask the question, you can't go back. Once you see the, like, once I saw those medical diagrams, I could not go back. I could not go back to not knowing what abortion was. And so I think that deep down we know that. And sometimes we just don't want the responsibility of being known as pro-life or having to do something. Um, And I know that was the case for me. Some people are afraid of being vilified or fired. Like, that's a very real possibility. Um, if you're in a workplace that is extremely liberal, then yeah, you you might experience um, retribution or, um, I mean, I know people that have to be very careful in Did the Did you experience anything like that? I didn't. You know, I was so scared and then I was fine. <laughs> the Lord really took care of me. Now, my story is very different because the Lord called me into full-time missionary work where it was okay to be extreme. Um, and I 
so there were a couple of years later, well, a year later, I went to Washington, D.C. on an internship. And I was in a very liberal environment in a building of – it was a satellite campus for our state schools. And I was in a building of like 300 people, and I'm pretty sure I was the only one that was going to church on Sunday. And so I remember like I can see a distinct change in – I mean, this is beautiful, the spiritual growth that the Lord allowed me to have, but a distinct change in my reaction because at first I was afraid to say, I, I was afraid to even associate with the people that were pro-life. And then when I was in Washington, D.C., where the stakes were a little bit higher because we were six blocks away from the White House and, you know, there was all of this political environment and I was a very liberal environment educationally. Um, we were walking down the street past Planned Parenthood Metropolitan D.C., which is up the street from the White House, very politically active student center. It was a Planned Parenthood, but kind of like stands for Planned Parenthood, right? Because it's right in the center. And so we were walking by and there were these people praying outside. Now, later I found out this is 40 Days for Life. At the time, I was like, wow, this is so great. It's like they're on a schedule. They're all praying here all the time. And I had a choice to make it. I remember being there one Saturday and I was out with my roommate who was not on the same page as me, not Catholic, not pro-life. And I remember looking at them and having a choice to say hi and greet the pro-lifers or to ignore them. And my friend, we ended up splitting and my friend went to greet the pro-choice ex escorts who were extorting, who were escorting women into Planned Parent to have their abortions, my roommate at the time. And then I went to the pro-life volunteers who were praying in front of the abortion center to say hi. And it was, um, you know, it was a, a decision I had to make. Like, do I let all of my cohorts see and know that I'm pro-life or do I keep it secret? And I, my courage had been bolstered over the, you know, the year that I learned about pro-abortion and, uh, or pro-life stuff and learned about what abortion was and got involved in the pro-life movement. But, um, I didn't lose her as a friend, you know, and that was what was shocking to me. Like it was very scary to suddenly be publicly pro-life, but it actually didn't change anything. If anything, it just made people aware that they could come to me if they had questions. And I ended up making really good friends in front of the clinic who were pro-life and who I stayed in contact with after the the program. And I ended up bringing 40 Days for Life to my home diocese. Um, so it was funny because that fear that I had originally, one, over time, it became less and less. But two, it was irrational. And sometimes the enemy uses fear to keep us silent. Fear is not of the Lord. And so, yeah, so when the when we allow the Lord in, he, he will make a way, you know. Even if it's little by little, he'll make a way. So tell us a little bit about your relationship with the Lord and how this has strengthened your work as a missionary and activist. Yeah. And um, Catholic nerd. And Catholic nerd. Yeah. Well, when I got involved in pro-life work, I encountered a community of um, like pro-lifers, but a community of people who were practicing their faith and who had, I met people who had grown up Catholic and traditionally Catholic. I, uh, one of my closest friends, one the one of my teammates who became my closest friend, um, her family is Tridentine, right? And so they grew up going to Latin mass and I had, I had never encountered it. Um, I had never encountered that kind of traditional, the traditional um, faith that people have um, practice of the faith. And I encountered people who weren't Trinitine, right, but who had grown up Catholic and were very well catechized and really devout. And I saw that there was something different in, in these people. So yes, they were pro-life and we, it was so great to share this zeal that we had to end abortion and to educate and to evangelize. But I saw that there was something so beautiful and deep and profound about their faith. And I think that that's a gift that the pro-life movement gave me and that it has um, for a, a lot of people who are just getting started is that you encounter people who have a really profound faith in the Lord. And um, a very, I kind of think about it like if the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare, I think is, I've always said that I think that it's clearest in of all the ministries that I've been involved in, youth ministry, other types of missionary work, the spiritual warfare I think is clearest on the pro-life battlefront 
you kind of see, um, you just see so much in spiritually and you experience so much opposition spiritually. And so if you're not grounded in your faith and you're not praying consistently and um, you don't have healthy human relationships <laughs> with with people of the faith, then it'll chew you up and spit you out. And I've seen that. I've seen a lot of burnout and people get discouraged. Um, and so I think that it takes really strong uh, people of faith and strong faith to lead in that in that particular apostolate. Um, and so it's been a great gift to me to meet those people. And I've met people that are, um, I'm sure, I mean, Joe, Joe Scheidler, Scheidler was one of the first pro-life activists, like the first people on the sidewalk. Um, and I, I had the very great honor of meeting him a couple of times, and I really think he's a saint. Like, he just was so, so attentive. And um, and you could tell, like, he just had an ongoing conversation with the Lord. Um throughout the day. And he would look at you and promise to pray for you by name. He had a little book where he would keep people's names and he, he would come up to you. And after a conversation, he would say, you know, I'd like to pray for you. Tell me your name so I can write it down. And he would just write your name down and pray for you by name. And so I met people like that for the first time in my life. And so my relationship with the Lord deepened. Um, and just knowing, um, knowing the truth and getting closer to the truth and learning more about the faith and learning more about the history of the Catholic Church um, through just through my activity but and the apostolic work, but also the people around me. It just made me fall deep, more deeply in love with the Lord and with the church um, and feel so honored to be able to do apostolic work and to understand what it meant to be on mission um, and, and just I think also when you become more and more convicted about the dignity of our humanity and learn more about our human development and how beautifully and intricately we're made, it just makes you marvel at the humanity of Jesus um, and about like the great gift he's given us, not only in our lives, but in his life um, and in drawing close to us through his life. It's beautiful to hear how you came to work as a missionary, but through this work, your relationship with the Lord has really deepened. Absolutely. That and that might even be the greatest gift is yeah, it's great to travel the country and it's it was I mean I'm still blessed by all of the relationships that I've made and the friendships that I have, but the greatest gift is always, you know, to be close to Jesus. And for me as hard-headed and prideful as I am, it took full-time activism and pro-life work and um, traveling all over the country and doing these great things. It took that for the Lord to 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 break down my heart and my barriers to draw close to him. And I'm so grateful for his mercy. You know, all of that is um, his mercy. St. Therese said, all is grace, right? And I feel like um, I could have ended up, if I had gone on the path that I thought I was supposed to be when I was a freshman in college, I could have end up, ended up in a, you know, very monotonous, maybe Catholic, but not super devout place. But in his mercy, he called me out of that and called me to, to mission and, and drew me close to himself f through that. Right. And we are thankful that you are here now in the Rio Grande Valley. Yes. Uh, how, how, now tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Oh, yeah. Um, so while I was on mission, um, so with the pro-life group that I ended up becoming a part of, we would go all over the country to different campuses. And I was on a tour in New York. And um, while I was on tour in New York, when, uh, we were invited to a meeting for Corazón Puro. And um, that was my first introduction to Corazón Puro. I went back home and forgot about it, thought it was a great thing. That's, and for those who yeah. may not be familiar with Corazón Puro. Corazón Puro is an apostolate of the CFRs, uh, Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, um, to evangelize about authentic love, um, making authentic love more known and more um Realized, I would say, in society, you know, we have affiliates in various parts of the world, and we uh, focus on Franciscan spirituality, um, community life, and uh, living an authentic Catholic life in chastity. And so I, I left full-time pro-life work for a little bit and felt called to join Corazón Puro's House of Formation for a woman called Casa Guadalupe. It's a house of prayer, healing, and discernment, and 
um, the women who live there are full-time missionaries with Corazón Puro. So I, I continued mission work, but it was in a little bit of a different capacity. Um, so I lived there for two years and I was doing full-time work with Corazón Puro on the East Coast. Um, and I just fell more, you know, more in love with mission, more in love with the Lord. And um, I came on mission to the Valley for, I gosh, it's now four years ago for the um, Diocese of Brownsville. It was like a development um, week for religious educators um, and catechists. Um, so they were, it was like a week of formation days. And so Corazón Puro came and we did the formation for these uh, catechists and religious ed directors. And during that week, I mean, I, I kind of got thrown into mission and this is our thing, formation. And I came on mission and was really happy. And we had a bunch of missionaries here who were also building houses. But during that week, I just fell in love with the valley and I, I felt a very distinct call, you know, to come back. Um, and so a year later I discerned a call to come back and move, just move, just, just come. Um, and I felt the Lord's invitation to just come to the valley. I realize now how unusual that is. I didn't think it was unusual <laughs> at the time because it was so profound. Um, and so I came to the valley just uh, as a missionary with Corazón Puro and also just seeing what the Lord had here um, and have been happy here ever since and started teaching recently <laughs> and um yeah just getting involved with pro-life work here with the pro-life office of the diocese and well we are grateful that you are here and we want to continue this conversation so we want to yeah. have you back um again next week so that we can talk a little bit more about um the defense of life absolutely sanctity of life yeah sounds and great the work that that uh, awaits us all in that regard. Uh, so it's been a delight. We've been talking today to Christina Garza, who is, um, how did we describe you? <laughs> Missionary, <laughs> All of activist, things. educator, Catholic nerd. We'll talk a little bit more about that <laughs> in our next program as well. But here on um, Women in the Frontera, we also like to give a Frontera tip um, at the end of our closing of our program. What tip do you have for for us today? And it would be this song by Damascus Worship, Hail uh, Halo Queen. And it's just a beautiful, it's uh, it's contemporary, so I don't know if I could call it a hymn, but it's a song to Our Lady, and it's just, I really love it. That's the thing I've had on repeat this week. Beautiful. Well, and my tip is definitely um, Bishop Flores was taping uh, some courses on the Eucharist, and so I highly recommend the um, the document by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, The Mystery of the Eucharist and the Life of the Church. Mm, A lot of good nuggets in there, reminders, too. Um, of the gift of the of the Eucharist in our lives. So I highly recommend that. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Brenda. God bless you. Thank you. And we enjoy we invite all of you to join us next week as we talk about the sanctity of life and what we can do to defend uh, life at every stage. Thank you, Christina, for joining us. Yeah, thank it's you for having pleasure. me. It's been it's been wonderful. Well, we invite everyone we invite everyone to join us next week as we continue our conversation on the sanctity of life and the role that we can each play in this um, most important endeavor. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today on Women in la Frontera. Until next time, let's go and use the gifts God has given us to set the world on fire with God's love and grace. Amen. Amen. Amen.